Welcome back to Partnerships Unraveled, the podcast where we unravel the mysteries about channel and partnerships on a weekly basis. My name's Alex Whitford. I'm the VP of Revenue here at Chanex, and I'm excited to welcome our special guest this week, Peter. Peter, how are you doing? I'm fine, Alex. How are you? Yeah, really good, thanks. Um, Maybe for the uh, benefit of our listeners, are you able to give us a quick introduction, who you are, where you've been, and what's your role? Absolutely, and thank you for the invitation. Much appreciated. So my name is Peter Geitenbeek. I'm working as the director for the EMEA channel at Delinea. In that role, I'm responsible for driving the entire channel community in uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. I'm very lucky that I'm not doing that alone. I've got a team of uh, 11 people working together with me. Uh, I am an industry veteran, as some people would say. Uh, Next year, I will celebrate my 160th uh, quarter uh, in my life. So that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, and I'm I, I, I excited to also announce maybe on your behalf, but I think you are quite literally an expert because you've quite literally written the book on the channel, right? You really understand how that works. Yeah, that's correct. I'm finalizing my book about channel. Uh, it's basically covering what I call an eight-step plan in building and managing a channel organization. So thanks for that, Alex, <laughs> mentioning it. Much appreciated. L- yeah. Little plug in there. That's, yeah. what, that's why we're on. Um, but no, I think um, I've, I've obviously gone through all the way back to Symantec. You've been working in the channel for years and years. Um, one of the things I very often uh, joke around how the channel work is we're one of the few industries where seemingly not much has changed. We still do a lot of the things that we used to do 15, 20 years ago. I'd love to see if you uh, share that perspective. Oh, that's a very interesting. I don't share that uh, perspective. <laughs> And it's really interesting uh, that you mention it, because when I was writing the book and a friend of mine was proofreading it, he said, Peter, I'm missing a part about, okay, how did the channel evolve? And I said, that's a great, uh, a great idea. So I started to do some research about, okay, how the channel evolved. And in a way, I concur with what you just said, because, you know, we're doing already for years and years and centuries, uh, we're doing the same, because uh, there were channels in the past as yeah. well, although they didn't know that it was a channel. <laughs> But I think the, um, the way that we are dealing with channel has di- is way different than, for example, that we did in the past. And uh, the way that we're managing channels is, is very different to, to the past. W- what, what changes have you seen? So, okay. So if I look, for example, when I started in the, working in the channel, uh, what I saw is that resellers were very interested in a vendor. And, and initially, they were about to sign up as many vendors as they could because it acted like a sort of advertisement uh, uh, sign say, okay, you know, we've got all these brands and we can help you, uh, dear customer. What I've seen changing over the year, that this is really uh, changing and turned around. So instead, vendors are now turning into partners to basically approach end users. And uh, the resellers are very, very um, selective on the kind of vendors that they are now choosing. Uh, In the past, they also saw that signing up 100 vendors is simply not doable because your salespeople need to know, let's say that on average, a vendor has 20 products. With 100 vendors, you ne- they need to have roughly 2,000 products. Nobody can do that. And what you see at this moment in time is that on average, a reseller has around 30 vendors, and they're already struggling to, to manage all those vendors. But also think of the pressure on the salespeople, because if you have 30 vendors, I can ha- guarantee you one thing, that there will be 30 channel account matches from those vendors all over those salespeople saying, hey, you need to sell my product. Can we do a marketing campaign? So that's something which we saw really changing. Yeah, one of the things that I've, um, and, and I think you're, you're absolutely right, we're certainly not exactly the same as we were in the 90s. What I find funny is some of the same swivel chair processes, the people with people relationships, they've not evolved maybe is the, the rate of change that we've seen in, in, in other industries. One of the things that I have noticed has changed is previously, I think the, the name of the game was site for a partner, was sign the right vendor, right? If you if you if you bet on Cisco twenty five years ago, you're in a pretty good spot twenty five years ago because you just climbed yeah. with them. Now I'm I'm really seeing that evolution has switched around, and now I'm seeing a lot of vendors are having to bet on the right partner and that real management of key partner relationships and having the right strategy around how you onboard, retain, and engage partners. The, the brands that do the, that the best, they're the ones that are getting the outside return. Do you see, sort of see that where you're sitting? Yes, absolutely, yeah. And, you know, it's, I think what has also has been playing more and more is that the vendor selection from the reseller perspective has been determined by, okay, what's the contribution of that specific vendor? Are they able to uh, make some good money out of that uh, in the short term but also on the longer term? 
Yeah, I think one of the things we, we often evangelize here when we talk about partner acquisition is from my experience, and I've, I've done a, a fair job signing up thousands of partners maybe in my career, and, and I see partners fundamentally only really care about three things. Who do they need to sell to? How much money are they going to make? Not just in the product, but in wraparound services. And how easy is it to sell? And it, exactly. if, you, if you get that pyramid right, I we have lots of those types of customers already, it's very easy to sell and we're going to make pretty good money. If that pyramid's in balance, you've got a really scalable methodology to acquire partners. Absolutely, concur with that, yeah. Um, so that that's what has changed. What hasn't changed that you really would love to see change within the channel? Okay, that's a very good question. So um, what hasn't changed, what I think, and that's something which I think still is very important and I should not change. So let's start with that one. And that is people doing business together with people. Yeah, that's always... Um, and, and I, I found that out, for example, uh, after the, the COVID period, where we basically had uh, all kind of 30-minute slots, you know, through Zoom sessions or team sessions or what have you. But after uh, the COVID went away and, and we were able to meet again uh, face-to-face with partners, you saw that what you could achieve in a face-to-face meeting with a partner and having really in-depth discussions about their business and what is driving them and, and how we can jointly work together... That was really a game change and still is a game change. So it's about people working with people. And that's something we never should change. What we should change is maybe, I think, the way how we are thinking of working together with pe- uh, with partners. I think if you are building a channel, uh, you really have to think, okay, what do you want the channel to do? Um, do you want them to simply sell your solution or do you also want them to bring you business or do you bring business to them? So depending on what what you expect from the people, you also have to um, realize yourself as a vendor, for example, how are you going to help them and to motivate them, to enable them, and that's something, and I think that's something where we really, as as an industry, have to do a better job. We often simply say, okay, let's assign a partner, and then um, we give them a training, a sales training of 30 minutes of half an hour or an hour, and then, um, especially the expectation of the salespeople from the vendor, they think, okay, now, now things will get started. But then they see, okay, you, you, you need to continuously work on it. I always say internally, um, it takes a village to build, uh, to, to raise a child. And, and it, it also raises, uh, it, it, yeah, you need a village to, to build up a partnership. And I think that that's something which is really, really, very important. And uh, so what we need to change is the thinking about how to work with your partners and how to enable them. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And it's one of the things that really frustrates me about sometimes how channels are orchestrated or architected is we either overload or underload a partner depending on what our expectations are of them. And so for me, you know, I've sat in engineering and pre-sales and post-sales sessions when we're speaking about a referral partner who's just going to toss a lead over the fence. It's like, why are we doing this? Like, if we've got a, a very clear expectation of what we need from the partner, have we explained it to them? Yeah. Have we explained how we are going to support them? Have we told them the goal, the time frame, the roles and responsibilities? What's in it for them? What's in it for us? And if, if a partner doesn't know that immediately, then we're just wasting each other's time, right? Yeah. And, and I think that's the real power. We're, we're really big on automation and, and scale here at Chanex. But frankly, the bit that we want to preserve is the one-to-one relationship, right? How can we get people with people more often by automating everything else so that we can have those candid conversations? Yeah. 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 Um, what I'd love to get into is um, we've been speaking actually earlier today around the impact of product maturity for a channel vision. And, and you've worked in a very mature product segment. You've worked in a more immature product segment. Can you talk to us around the challenges, the opportunities of building a channel in each of those different yeah. Points. And, and this is a topic which is really uh, close to my heart, uh, Alex. Uh, um, what if people always ask me, okay, what's your favorite book, especially when it comes to sales and, and sales and marketing and building channels? And I always refer to uh, your own book. No, no, that, <laughs> well, absolutely. Uh, but I always refer to Jeffrey Moore's uh, "Crossing the Chasm." Yeah, and I love that book. So basically, uh, Jeffrey Moore is basically describing the product life cycle mm-hmm. and then mapping the product life cycle, okay, in, in the go-to-market model. So in the first part, where you really have the introduction of your solution, he basically recommends that you go direct and basically create a couple of reference customers. Reference customers that can be used um, to reference other customers and convince other customers to buy your solution. Then when the product matures, um, especially when that, in that maturing, that first maturing phase, 
you will see that you will have partners that really, uh, you need partners that are really able to do implementations and, and deliver services, really add value around your solution. When your product even further matures, you will basically create a mass and then uh, transactional business becomes more and more important. And that is also where the part where you, for example, are looking to increase the number of sales points uh, and distribution can, be a, can play a very important uh, part in that uh, perspective. And then in the end, when your product goes down, you need to come up with all kinds of ideas of, okay, how can you incentivize, how can you motivate the partners to really push your solution more? So for me, that product lifecycle and mapping it to the go-to-market model is really a very, very important aspect. Is that an answer for your question, Alex? Yeah, 100%. And, and Crossing the Chasm is an absolutely fantastic book. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting is that life cycle curve that you see, which starts low and then creeps up and then tails off towards the end. That's actually, in my opinion, a great mirror, maybe slightly lagging, on the size and scale of your channel as well. You're very, very focused early on in depth rather than breadth. As your product matures, as it becomes more commoditized, easier to create that critical Correct. mass, yeah. you can then scale your channel wider and wider. And then as it starts to tail off, you want to actually bring it slightly tighter and focus more on value. One of the key mistakes that I see so often in, in channel is people try to scale before they've actually worked out how to go deep. And so we're adding breadth before depth. And the problem is you actually don't know what's working yet. Yeah. And so then it's really easy to waste a load of time. As you say, it takes a village to raise a partnership. Imagine a village raising a partnership that actually is doomed for failure because we don't, we're don't, we not really sure quite why we're winning yet. Yeah. And so for me, it's really, really critical that we understand, hey, we've, we've got these seven relationships in France. They're working really, really well. Now we know why they're working well. I can replicate those relationships in Benelux and Germany and wherever else because I know why we're winning. And then it's really important that we scale from there. Yep. Is that something that you've seen and you've deployed when you've, when you've started maturing that product stage and maturing your channel? Um, that's something that we started to see. Yes, definitely. And, and it's something... So the interesting thing is that if you look to our business, and um, at this moment in time, I'm not only responsible for the EMEA market, but also for the APEC market. <coughs> now, the APEC market is less developed than, for example, uh, some of the European uh, countries. Now, and especially in those markets where we, the initial step from a lot of people that have a traditional channel um, background is, okay, let's appoint a distributor and then let the distributor do the acquisition. So uh, I always prefer, and I said, okay, if you look to those countries, why are we not, for example, focusing on one partner that is helping us to build a business and then select a partner that is basically has a, a, a breadth of uh, customers so we can basically mine their customer base instead of uh, building uh, initially uh, assigning a distributor. And the reason why I'm saying that is that over time I've also learned, and I've done that as well, you know, I've made that mistakes, but what I'm seeing is that people uh, and companies are starting to appoint a distributor in a region, like for example, take Vietnam. Yeah? And that is a market that is maybe has an addressable market of 400 to 500K uh, annual recurring revenue. It takes us on average uh, three to six months to enable a partner or a distributor. So um, when we enable the distributor and then the distributor, we are going to ask them to target partners and resellers, we lose six months. So that's why I simply say, okay, select one reseller, work with them, uh, give them all the leads and work with them, make them successful. And then when you reach a stage of 500 to 1 million, then you can start thinking of a distributor and, and, and uh, uh, further building that business. Yeah, 100%. I think, uh, you know, my distribution is close to my heart. I spent seven years either managing distributors uh, within Zoom or, or working within distribution. And, and what I so often found is we would, especially American-led companies, would which have a very direct go-to-market motion. It's one legal, it's one tax, it's one currency. It's very simplified. And then they go, right, we need to go to EMEA. We'll appoint a distributor and hopefully they'll just crack on and do all the work. And you go, but what type of partners work here? Do we understand the information? What messaging is working? How are we coordinating between the partner and the end user? If you don't have great detail and substance for how that works, you can't delegate the responsibility to someone else because you're just hoping that it's going to work and they're never going to be as good as you are yep. because they don't know your proposition as well as you do. Exactly. So I fully agree. You've got to, you've really got to uh, win, I would even suggest, with multiple partners so that you can take those learnings, give them to distribution as this is the blueprint now. Now can you go and add 10, 15, 20, 30, 100 partnerships and really scale the depth in that channel? And the irony is you've got to do that 
for each major new territory, right? And so sometimes the the idea of we'll just sign a tech data, they they cover all of you know Europe and EMEA and and US, that's great, and I think tech data do a brilliant job. But if they don't have the information to understand how to win within each one of those territories, it's really really hard to be successful. Exactly, absolutely, yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, the, how that product maturity changes your channel, what have you seen in terms of how marketing can play a really critical role in terms of the different scales of channel? Okay, so marketing, yeah, that, that's a very good question again. So the role of marketing, I think, is ba- especially if you look to the linear, the role of marketing is basically there to help us to create demand. Um, so w- what we're seeing and what we've seen, has that role changed? No, I don't think it has changed much. Um, what I do see is that there's more specializations in marketing. So, for example, you've got the corporate marketing but th- that is focusing on brand recognition. Then you've got channel marketing, which is, of course, focusing or could be focusing on mining your customer base of your partners, but it could also be f- aimed um, to, and working together with the distributors to, uh, to find new partners. And then, of course, you've got the lead generation. And uh, what I've seen changing there is that social media has become so uh, incredibly important, not only for customers where they do their orientation, their first orientation, but if you look to, um, uh, let's say, not not only the product life cycle, but also the customer life cycle and, and how they buy, yeah, the customer buyer cycle, um, you can really determine aspects in that, in, the, that li- in that buying cycle where marketing is playing a role. Um, if you can, if you understand how a customer is buying your solution, you can basically understand. Okay, you can start to influence how they gather the information. So we found out, for example, that in our buying cycle, um, the first orientation of uh, our customers that want to buy a, pa- a PAM solution is that they talk to their peers. So for us, it's very important that our peer, that peers are, are informed about our solution, that they have got the right materials, and that they can share the materials and that sort of stuff. In the second phase, where they start to orient uh, more, is that they want to have, um, let's say, demo versions that they can download. So it's really important that you understand that that buying cycle of your customer. And, and I think the role of marketing is basically adapted to that buying cycle more and more. Yeah, I, I, I love the categorization there, right? So when we talk about marketing, we could be talking about partner acquisition. We could be talking about end user acquisition. We could be talking about lead gen, demand gen. And you've got to have a very, very critical analysis. What's working? How are we measuring success? And what's our goal? That then balanced with, I, I think there's a there's a statistic that we, we use internally all the time, but 58% of B2B buyers first interact with a vendor on social media. And so then the question is, how do we make that work at scale? And I think one of the th- fundamental th- things that we see is you need a top-down and a bottom-up approach, which is how as a, as a brand are we using our corporate marketing to target end users and how are we getting partners to market on our behalf? And if you can create that wave, it increases velocity and conversion. I think that velocity impact is really important because if you can shorten a sales cycle from six months to four months, it makes a huge... Ooh, that's a huge difference. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I really see marketing playing a, a real role there in, in driving that velocity because, as you know, if we're trying to deliver 10 million in uh, in 12 months, but suddenly our, our sales cycle has just dropped by 40%, well, suddenly overachievement becomes much easier and then yeah. it's just a pure pipeline game. Yeah, true. Um, in terms of what major pain points do you see scaling a channel? Let's say we've started to hit that, that we're, we're now flowing into the uh, point where we need to generate mass product maturity starting to happen. We're starting to cross the chasm. How do you, what are the real big challenges in scaling far and wide? Yeah, basically, I think the, the biggest challenge that we have is enabling the channel and making sure that they are um, th- yeah, enabling the channel. I think that that's the most biggest challenge that you have. Can you give me uh, some examples of, of what friction points you mean by enablement? Yeah, so um, in, in a way, enablement is a learning journey as well. So um, if I look again, and if I, uh, I will give you examples of our solution, PAM. PAM is a very short word, free, only three letters, but it's an incredible, um, it's a challenging solution to implement. Um, so what for us, it's very important that we find partners that are, have the technical knowledge, not only from a, a network and security standpoint, but also they need to understand something about compliance, but also integrating in other solutions like SIEM solutions or other governance and, and, and regulation uh, solutions. So with that, um, your enablement program also needs to adapt that. So you, you cannot simply um, have a program that says, okay, 
take the CD out of the box, which is very old fashioned, but um, take the CD out of it, install it, press the, the setup button, and then, then make some settings. No, it, it's about integration. So how do you teach your partners how to integrate it? And the other aspects that we have, especially around enablement, is that how do you make sure that um, this, knowledge, this knowledge is basically um, kept alive by, for example, give them enough meat uh, and enough opportunities to continue uh, to execute on the enablement and uh, practice the enablement of the solution. So I think th that is one of the biggest challenges that I see. And, and you, you've spoken that it takes months to onboard a partner and get them fully enabled. How are you keeping them engaged within that period? Yeah, okay. So if I look to enablement, I always say there's four levels of enablement. So when you have a new partner and you enable them, the first one is basically enablement part of how to do business with each other. So you basically align the processes, the operational processes to each other. The, the first element then is the sales enablement. So you need to be able to, sell, uh, to tell the, the salespeople how to sell your solutions. Now, what we've seen is that you, you, you do not need to throw them with all kind of features, but you need to give them uh, the materials basically to give the use case scenarios where your solution is playing a role. You also need to give them uh, a view on, okay, how is your solution uh, contributing to the value of the company? And those are the main aspects in the, in the sales enablement. So that, that's something which you can do quite quickly. Um, then the, the, second, the third part of enablement is the pre-sales enablement. And what I often see is that those uh, enablement processes are basically done parallel. Mm -hmm. And what we've also seen is that, for example, when you have done the sales enablement and how to keep them motivated is, for example, encourage the salespeople to make uh, customer meetings. And basically what you then start to do is you do the first three to five visits you do jointly, where on the first two to three visits, uh, the vendor is making the pitch. And then on the fourth and the fifth uh, visit, you basically ask the salesperson to do the pitch. So you really have a good handover of, uh, of the sales enablement. And when they start to see that the customer is interested and um, motivated and, and, and interested in your solution and creates an opportunity for them, that's absolutely a, a very uh, an aspect uh, that is motivating the salespeople because they see the success and they also start to see the numbers in, the, in, the, in their eyes that uh, this could be a successful sale. One one of the things that um, I, I really see is that, that in that interim period before revenues really landed, the, those first three, four months, if a partner isn't creating opportunities, yeah. that's when they're high risk of churn. Is yeah. that something that you've seen? Yeah, that's absolutely what we've seen as well, you know. So, and, and again, you know, it's like a... a I always compare it like, okay, you're starting a relationship and you're dating the first time, you know, and everybody's on that pink cloud, as they always say it. And then after a couple of uh, dates, you start to see the, the strange behaviors of, uh, of, of, of the partner. Um, and that is basically what we call the motivation dip. And it's very important to recognize that and basically continue like, okay, this is what we can do to, uh, to continue that. So you really need to be aware of that motivation dip. Yeah, I, I really like the terminology. We, we I, I really see marketing playing the key role to smooth that motivation dip out, especially when we talk at scale. So um, uh, salespeople are financially motivated. We all want to hit our target as easily as possible. And if there's lots of opportunity, uh, I'm willing to put up with a lot of pain, right? So we've spoken about the pyramid. How easy is it to sell? How much money am I going to make? Uh, and who do I sell to? If it's really hard to sell, but I'm going to make lots of money, I'm really, I'm okay with that balance. As long as that balance is yeah. in, it, it, it is in balance. If it's really hard to sell and I'm not going to make much money, I'm never doing it, right? And so the way I really help um, businesses understand how you get through that motivation dip, if we're creating lots of opportunities together, I'm willing to put up with that pain for a very, very long time. Um, and this is coming from the guy that worked at Zoom, right? We had the biggest tailwind of all time with COVID. Hey, maybe some of our program wasn't optimal. Maybe some of this didn't work. We were really busy because everyone wanted to speak to us. But people were willing to put up with that pain because the demand was so high. Now, hard to, hard to recreate that. But I think marketing can really play a role. And sales can coordinate with marketing that when I'm speaking, I'm doing this enablement and hey, suddenly we have these inbound leads coming in because we've got our social media maybe turned on or however that function's working. That is, in my opinion, how we drive engagement and enablement at the same time to get people to that first revenue. Yeah, and, and again, you know, that ties into the buying cycle again of the customer because um, so you've had the first conversation with your end user customers together with the partner, the partner's getting enthusiastic, then the customer needs some time to digest this. So, and again, if you as a marketing um, uh, are able to hook into that aspect by, for example, feeding them with white papers about your solution or use case, specific use case scenarios, 
or even feed them with ROI cases. That really will help them to build the case internally as well um, to, to, um, to, to help them defend the investment that is needed in your solution. No, I, I, I completely agree. How can we make sales uh, life easier? How can we keep salespeople focused on the people, part of the relationship, and then dot the right content around them to make those conversations as smooth as possible? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a little bit about where the channel has been, how we drive a more mature market. I'm very bullish on how I think the channel is going to continue to become the most dominant revenue stream that we see in B2B business. How are you feeling about the next three to five years? How do you think channel is going to change? So it's interesting, you know, uh, I read some figures about from the World Trade Organization that 75% of the worldwide trade is gone through over uh, indirect sales channels. So that if you imagine that 75% of worldwide trade, so that's a huge, 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 huge number. So that already basically underlines the, uh, the importance of the, uh, of the channel. And if you look to the United States uh, inter- uh, tech industry and manufacturing industry, over 5 million people in the United States alone are working in, in, in indirect sales channels. So it's, it's a massive market and it's a very important way to basically uh, bring your products uh, to market. So how will it uh, change? That's a very good question. So what I'm seeing at this moment in time is, is a couple of developments. Of course, we see the developments with the marketplace, Azure Marketplace, uh, um, the, or Google Marketplace, and, and um, AWS. That is absolutely something that is um, starting to come up and will be a different uh, place and, and a different uh, distribution model. And I also start to see that, for example, companies like Microsoft, how they are starting to think about, okay, how can we bring products to market what I really like is um, a development that is currently taking place in the uh, in the United States and is offered to it because Microsoft doesn't want to offend and, and basically exclude uh, the channel from uh, from their marketplaces. So what they've done is this Microsoft private offer um, uh, an or an MPO where basically partners can offer their solution through the Microsoft marketplace towards an end user. The end user basically can use their uh, their Azure points uh, as an investment or as a payment method for buying that solution. And I think that integration of channel and and, and new uh, distribution method is absolutely something which I think is fantastic to see. The other thing that I'm starting to see is what I call uh, partner communities, where, for example, partners say are even further specializing. Not only, let's say, we're specializing on security or storage or what have you, but partners say, you know, I only want to do service delivery around security solutions. I'm no longer interested in selling licenses. But with that, um, they are starting to team up with, with what I call transactional, uh, transactional software uh, suppliers. And with that, you create partner communities that are really very, very strong. And I think it's very important that as a vendor, you start to understand, okay, what kind of partner communities can you build? I'll give you another example. Um, at this moment in time, one of the drivers for a PAM solution, for example, is cyber insurance. And what we are starting to do is basically starting to team up with cyber insurance companies and team them up with, for example, our partners. So in that way, basically a customer that uh, wants to have a cyber security, uh, cyber security insurance, um, they will either get a discount or they get um, uh, or a, a cyber insurance anyway. Uh, when they've got uh, a PAM solution in place. Now, the PAM solution needs to be implemented. If you can basically have a teaming between the cyber insurance company and a local partner, that is really beneficial for both of them. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And again, is when you democratize, specialization happens more and so what we're going to see and what microsoft are driving towards i've seen hubspot do this brilliantly as you democratize access to the marketplace what happens is is people become more and more specialized so you're absolutely right rather than being oh we sell cyber security we sell cyber security to this vertical and we just do the service delivery element because that's what you want rather than best in suite i want the best in everything um apple's done this tremendously well they built an app store and so rather than me having every apple app i use spotify i use whatever because i know that hey i prefer this piece but as long as i get access we get the specialization deeper and deeper and i think i completely agree that's where the channel is going to go because microsoft aws these other players are allowing me access i can focus on the bit that i'm extremely passionate about and i'm an expert in but the vehicle to pay and get the offer becomes easy to access allowing the end yeah. user to get a better quality of service it's another interesting point that you said about the app store uh, because um 
what we're seeing, especially with the PAM solution, is that PAM int- uh, needs to be integrated with other security solutions as well. And a lot of our partners are creating bridges and, and connectors to other so- uh, security solutions. And what we're now also starting to do is within our solution, we've got a platform. And in that platform, we basically also have what we call a sort of app store where our partners can basically offer their connector. And that can immediately be used by the, um, uh, by the end user. And, basically, and it's another way of uh, generating revenue for your partners. So I completely concur with that. So thanks for uh, highlighting yeah, that. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the simple thing is, right, if we can put the end user in mind and we work back from the outcome, uh, what you'll find is we get more organic ways of driving revenue. Because if we can just remove the operational friction of transaction more money flows through. So I think it's absolutely a great strategy that you're implementing there. Um, Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. The way we finish every guest podcast is I'd love to get a recommendation for you of who we should bring on next. Okay, I think, you know, uh, I really would like to recommend Silke Ahrens. Silke Ahrens is the EMEA director for uh, HubSpot. Um, I worked with Silke for almost two and a half years in the time that uh, Delinea was psychotic before the merge with Centrify. And I've learned a lot from her. And I think what uh, Silke can bring to, uh, especially to every channel organization, is very deep understanding about processes and, and, and why these are important and why it's so important that you have these processes defined. So I really recommend Silke for your next podcast, uh, Alex. Amazing. Silke will be reaching out. And Peter, thank you very much. It's been You're a pleasure. You're welcome. And thanks again. Thank you.